It's my pleasure today to kick off the symposium by introducing our, our first speaker, Michelle Manje. And many of you here at Stanford know Dr. Manje. Um, she's, she did her initial training, actually, her MD-PhD here at Stanford. She then stayed here for a medicine internship and then left us briefly to go to Partners Neurology Program in Boston and uh, then returned here to do a postdoctoral fellowship in the lab of Phil Beachy and a neuro-oncology fellowship. And since that time, she's really transformed the field of neuro-oncology. I don't think that's an exaggeration. And she's gonna tell you about some of her research now, so I don't wanna take away any of her thunder, but I'll just say that She's made incredible inroads at really understanding the basic biology of glia and neurons and how they interact in the brain and how that pertains to the development of cancers, particularly very, very bad cancers in children called high-grade gliomas. Along the way, she's won, won many awards and accolades. I don't really have time to list them all because they only gave me two minutes. Um, but I'll just mention she won something really important, which is a mentoring award for postdocs. She's an outstanding mentor. And then she um, also won the NIH Director's Pioneer Award, um, which is very well deserved. So Michelle, thank you for coming and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm going to speak to you today about neuron glial interactions in health and disease. Broadly, my research program focuses on understanding the molecular language that cells use as they communicate and work together to, to build and to remodel the brain. And I want to tell you one story today in two parts about the way in which neurons communicate with the glial cells that form the myelin sheath in the healthy brain, how this is a dynamic and um, experience dependent process uh, throughout life and, and how that contributes to, to healthy brain function and then how malignant glioma hijacks and subverts these interactions for its own gain. The process of brain development is, is really an astounding one, and it's one that continues for many, many years after birth. And in particular, myelination, the establishment of the myelinated infrastructure of the brain so important for, um, for neuronal communication and, and neural circuit dynamics develops over the course of about 30 years. So this is a really fascinating protracted process that follows predictable chronological and topographical patterns and, and understanding what regulates developmental and ongoing experience dependent adaptive myelination is important and fascinating in its own right, but it's also particularly salient as we consider malignancies of glia, because it turns out that, that particularly in childhood, glial malignancies follow a similar spatiotemporal pattern to developmental myelination. So that at a time when there is a discrete wave of myelination in the brainstem, particularly in the corticospinal tracts and the ventral pons, this is when the highest incidence of one of the worst human cancers, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma occurs uh, during mid-childhood. And similarly, when there is an active wave of myelination in the cortex and, and intercortical association fibers in adolescence and young adulthood, this is when pediatric glioblastomas of the cerebral hemispheres tend to occur. And this uh, concordant spatiotemporal pattern of myelination and glial malignancy occurrence is, it really fits with observations from my lab and from others that these malignancies appear to arise from precursor cells in the oligodendroglial lineage, either bona fide oligodendrocyte precursor cells or OPCs, or just earlier precursors. And certainly is concordant with molecular observations that these tumors very closely resemble normal OPCs. And so we may learn really important lessons about what drives gliomagenesis by better understanding the process of normal gliogenesis. And this asks the very basic question, what does regulate the proliferation and functional differentiation of oligodendroglial lineage cells? 
Well, one hypothesis that has been in the literature for, for a number of years was the idea that neurons themselves may regulate the extent to which their axons are myelinated. This is actually an idea that was first introduced by our own Ben Barris here at Stanford when he was a postdoctoral fellow with Martin Raff and then was supported by some really beautiful in vitro and correlational observations. Um, but it remained a fairly controversial topic in the glial field, in part because there are also very clearly activity independent modes of myelination. And so when I started my laboratory at Stanford, now almost 10 years ago, one of the first questions that we sought to, to answer was, does neuronal activity, at least in some regions of the nervous system, regulate myelination? Can myelin be plastic and adaptable? And I want to introduce you to the people who, who led this work. Um, he, this is Erin Gibson. She was one of my first postdoctoral fellows. She's now on faculty here at Stanford as an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and, and is definitely somebody to watch. She's absolutely brilliant. And this is Anna Garrity, who's a current postdoctoral fellow in the lab. And together, Erin, uh, Anna, and others in the lab uh, leveraged another technique uh, born of, of work here at Stanford um, called optogenetics. And, and what we did was to use in vivo optogenetics, which as many people in this audience know, allows for control of neuronal activity um, by expressing microbial opsins and then controlling those opsin expressing neurons using light. And so we targeted deep layer cortical projection neurons and expressed a, um, a light sensitive cation channel called channel rhodopsin 2 isolated from algae. And what that allows us to do is to then deliver light at the surface and regulate action potentials um, in the target cells at the frequency at which the light is delivered. And so if we do this in the motor planning area of the brain, the M2 cortex, then a mouse um, uh, in this experiment will exhibit complex motor output. So you see in this video here, we're now pulsing blue light at 20 Hertz, which is the frequency at which these uh, cortical projection neurons typically fire in the motor cortex, and that elicits complex motor output. So we know that we physiomimetically uh, stimulated this circuit, and that allows us to then ask straightforward questions about how other cell types within the stimulated circuit respond to changes in neuronal activity. And uh, what we found was that um, cortical projection neuronal activity elicits a rapid and robust proliferation of oligodendrocyte precursor cells, specifically within the stimulated circuit, and even more specifically within the cortical colossal projections of that circuit. And what we find is that these proliferating OPCs, if we fate map them over time, generate new oligodendrocytes and that the myelin ultrastructure within that circuit changes. It changes in a way that we would predict would alter um, circuit dynamics, circuit function, and perhaps influence behavior. And indeed, what we found was that motor functional behavior in these mice improved with daily repetitive stimulations in a way that depended upon the generation of new oligodendrocytes. And so we then wondered what molecular mechanisms were mediating this important interaction between neurons and oligodendroglial cells. Um, and we tested the molecular hypothesis that activity regulated release of the neurotrophin brain derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF might be an important component of this physiology. And we did this in two ways. Um, we used two different genetic mouse models. One um, that Mike Greenberg, our collaborator um, contributed in which there's impaired activity regulated expression of BDNF. These mice have baseline levels of um, BDNF that are relatively normal, but they can't increase BDNF expression and secretion in response to activity because the Krebs binding site um, is deleted in the BDNF promoter. And in a second genetic mouse model, instead of um, altering uh, the ligand, we instead altered the receptor, specifically and inducibly deleting BDNF receptor TREC B just in oligodendrocyte precursor cells at various points of postnatal life. And what we found in both of these mouse models is that when we optogenetically stimulated cortical projection neuronal activity, that the expected activity dependent oligodendroglial response was lost in mice that either lacked activity dependent um, expression of BDNF um, or that lacked OPC specific expression of the TREC B receptor. As there was no oligodendrocyte precursor cell proliferation as observed in wild 
type animals, there was similarly no new oligodendrogenesis, oligodendrogenesis, no generation of new oligodendrocytes, and no change in myelin ultrastructure. And so while this is a more um, complex mechanism, we're sure than, than um, BDNF to track B signaling alone, this gives us a molecular handle to begin to specifically manipulate activity dependent responses of myelin while leaving intact homeostatic myelination. And so we began to use this mouse model um, in which we can specifically and inducibly delete the BDNF receptor TREK-B at various points of postnatal life um, to try to ask what role these adaptive changes play in cognitive function. And I'll show you one experiment here in which we tested the role of, um, of adaptive myelination in attention and very short-term memory function using um, a, a pretty straightforward test called the novel object recognition test. And, and so as many people in the audience are probably familiar Familiar, this test um, uh, involves placing a mouse in a chamber with two identical objects, allowing the mouse to explore and get to know these objects, and then removing the mouse for a period of time. And here we use just a five minute interval of taking the mouse out of the cage, uh, during which time we replace one of the objects with a novel object. And now a healthy mouse, when replaced back in the cage, if it had paid attention to, and in these five minutes remembered what it had previously seen, would spend more time, a little bit more time, with the novel object. Um, but uh, mice that, that don't adequately pay attention or that can't, um, you know, remember in that short period of time what they saw will spend equal times with both object. And what we found is that mice that lost activity dependent myelination about a month before the experiment, either with deletion in the juvenile period or in adulthood, uh, performed very poorly in this test, suggesting that activity dependent myelination is contributing to um, intact attentional and short term memory function. And so to summarize what, what I've told you, this um, activity dependent myelination, which uh, depends at least in cortical projection neurons upon activity dependent BDNF release um, and signaling to the OPC, um, then you know, contributes to ongoing changes in myelin ultrastructure that contribute to intact cognitive performance. And we found that in disease states, such as the cognitive impairment that occurs commonly after cancer chemotherapy, disruption of these neuron glial interactions with loss of activity dependent BDNF release results in a loss of these um, plastic changes in myelin and contributes importantly to impaired cognitive performance. The new oligodendrocytes what we and others in the field are learning can contribute to myelin changes in multiple ways. There is a remodeling uh, by existing oligodendrocytes in an activity dependent way and new internode generation by new oligodendrocytes, both on previously unmyelinated axons, as well as in newly recognized um, naked segments of axons that, that can be tuned by adding a, a myelin internode. And we and others are, are learning that there are, are multiple implications for this plasticity of myelin in normal neurological and cognitive function, as it's becoming increasingly clear that adding these small changes to myelin help to promote coordinated circuit function and, and promote um, dynamic uh, uh, states such as, as uh, increased oscillatory synchrony within neural networks. And so Bill Richardson's group in the UK has shown that new oligodendrocyte generation is important for certain forms of motor learning. We have found that um, these, these adaptive changes help to promote healthy attention, short-term memory function, and together um, with uh, Paul Franklin's group have shown that these also contribute to memory consolidation. And so given the role of this myelin plasticity and normal neurological function, it stands to reason that dysfunction or dysregulation of myelin plasticity may importantly contribute to um, various forms of disease. Um, and, and conversely, we may be able to leverage these, um, these molecular insights to help promote remyelination after demyelinating injury. As we consider disease, um, I, I mentioned very briefly in the interest of time, um, our discovery that, that loss of myelin plasticity is an important contributor, at least in preclinical models, to chemotherapy-induced cognitive impairment. Uh, in collaboration with John Huguenard here at Stanford, um, a really brilliant uh, fellow in the lab um, who will soon be beginning her own lab here in the Department of Neurology, Juliet Knowles, is funding that, that aberrant increases in myelination, aberrantly increasing network synchrony as a result contribute to absence epilepsy development. 
And the question arises, could these powerful neuronglial interactions that promote as a first step um, precursor cell proliferation be contributing in the context of glial malignancies? And so I want to introduce you to a, a really absolutely brilliant um, student who helped to lead this lab in my, uh, who helped to lead this work in my lab, Hamsa Venkatesh. She joined me as a graduate student and then continued on as a postdoctoral fellow um, together uh, in my lab with Rob Malenka's lab. And Hamsa and others in, in our group, including uh, Tessa Johung, who's now an epilepsy fellow here, uh, use the same optogenetic model to now ask how do malignant glia respond to changes in neuronal activity? Um, and so we use that same experimental paradigm, stimulating premotor cortical projection uh, neuronal activity, but this time in the context of a diffusely infiltrating high-grade glioma. We're stimulating the, um, the frontal cortex in a juvenile mouse. And so we, um, in this experiment, xenografted a cortical glioblastoma from an adolescent patient of mine. And what we found is that just like their normal counterparts, malignant glioma cells increase proliferation in response to increased neuronal activity. And that this results in a circuit specific increase in tumor burden. So brain activity can, can regulate brain cancer progression. And, and we wanted to understand, of course, the mechanisms by which this might occur. And so to do that, we turned to a different experimental model system, one in which um, we took acute cortical slices, healthy brain slices from uh, non-tumor bearing mice, and then um, collected their secreted factors in condition medium uh, from brain slices that exhibit different levels of neuronal activity. So either tetrodotoxin silenced um, slices, spontaneously active slices, or slices in which we've driven um, neuronal activity optogenetically in C2, and then place that condition medium containing activity regulated secreted factors onto patient derived cultures of um, different forms of high grade glioma from children and adults. And what we found was that there was an activity de dose dependent increase in glioma cell proliferation that was lost um, when uh, brain slices were silenced with tetrodotoxin. Now, these different forms of high grade glioma that occur in children and in adults are a really clinically and molecularly distinct subtypes of this disease, but we found that the response to neuronal activity regulated factors was conserved across multiple different forms of high grade glioma from uh, pediatric and adult uh, glioblastoma to uh, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma and anaplastic oligodendroglioma. So the question arises, what is in this condition medium? Um, so we, you know, perform biochemistry and proteomic analyses of the condition medium. And this allowed us to develop a discrete list of activity regulated factors, those uh, proteins that are increased in um, the condition medium and result uh, as a result of neuronal activity. And what we found was that uh, after candidate sufficiency and necessity testing, that there were two key mechanisms. Uh, not unexpectedly, as BDNF plays this important role in normal neuronglial interactions, we found that BDNF was, again, an important glioma mitogen. But really unexpectedly, we found this molecule, neuroligin-3, uh, first discovered by, by yet another uh, uh, illustrious uh, Stanford professor, Tom Sudoff. And what we found was that neuroligin-3 functions as a surprisingly powerful glioma mitogen. Now, neuroligin-3 is, is a well-studied and well-known postsynaptic adhesion molecule. Um, this is a, a cartoon I took from one of um, Tom's beautiful review articles. Uh, we you know, know that in, in certain familial forms of autism, um, a mutated form of neuroligin-3 is an important contributor in the healthy, at the healthy synapse, it uh, contributes to, to synaptic strength. Um, it's present at both um, the excitatory and inhibitory synapses, but this is not a molecule that is known to be a mitogen in any context. And in fact, it was at the time not even known to be uh, cleaved and, and shed. But we find that neuroligin-3 is um, cleaved and released in a strictly activity dependent fashion and, and summarizing a couple years of work with one Western blot, <laughs> I'll tell you that uh, we find that neuroligin-3 is cleaved at the membrane through um, activity regulated function of the metalloprotease atom 10. 
So the next basic question is what cell types are shedding neuroligin-3? Uh, well, neuroligin-3 is expressed by postsynaptic cells and, and so of course multiple classes of neurons express neuroligin-3. But another um, cell type that expresses high levels of neuroligin-3 and is also a postsynaptic cell type is the oligodendrocyte precursor cell. Uh, we've known for now 20 years um, based on the work by Dwight Burgles, um, who also has a Stanford connection, was a postdoctoral fellow here, um, that neuroligin-3, I'm sorry, that, that synapses form between neurons and oligodendrocyte precursor cells. The OPCs are always postsynaptic. They're both excitatory and inhibitory uh, so-called axon glial synapses. And, and these are very well characterized now and replicated by multiple groups. Um, we still don't know the function of the axon glial synapse, at least not fully, um, but they certainly exist. And so we tested the idea that not only neurons, but perhaps OPCs may be contributing to the activity regulated secreted pool of neurons. Neuroligin 3. And we tested this by conditionally deleting neuroligin 3 from various um, cell types. And what we found is that not only neurons, but also really importantly, OPCs contribute to this pool of shed neuroligin 3. This kind of places the OPC in the tumor microenvironment for the first time and also begs very important basic questions about what role neuroligin 3 may be playing in normal myelin biology. And so the next set of questions that we set out to ask was how important is this mechanism for glioma growth? There are many cell intrinsic ways uh, through which gliomas uh, grow and progress. There are also a number of microenvironmental factors that regulate glioma progression. And so we wanted to understand the relative contribution of neuroligin-3 to this. And to do that, what we did was we xenografted patient-derived gliomas into the environment of either the neuroligin-3 wild type or the neuroligin-3 knockout brain. And what we found was really unexpected. Rather than simply slowing growth, we found that gliomas failed to progress in the absence of microenvironmental neuroligin-3. Here I'm showing you images of these green glioma cells growing in a, a, a wild type, um, neuroligin-3 wild type brain. And here in a neuroligin-3 knockout brain, six months after xenografting, here are the cells that we place there, they, they persist but they, they don't expand. And we can monitor that expansion or lack of expansion using in vivo bioluminescent imaging. And what we find is that there is this stagnation of glioma growth in the neuroligin-3 knockout environment until about six months when a subset of these xenografts appear to circumvent this apparent uh, complete dependency and grow through mechanisms of resistance we're, we're trying now to understand. This dependency on neuroligin-3 is conserved across multiple different forms of glioma and in multiple brain regions. It's just as true for diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma growing in the pons as it is um, GBM growing in the cortex. But this dependency on neuroligin-3 does not extend to a patient-derived model of breast cancer brain metastasis, suggesting that while this is a critically important uh, mechanism apparently for gliomas, it is not necessarily relevant to all types of brain cancer. And so I've just told you that neuroligin-3 is this really interesting therapeutic target and that ADAM10 is the enzyme that regulates its release into the tumor microenvironment. Conveniently, there's a brain penetrant um, ADAM10 inhibitor that has been through phase two, three clinical trials for other indications. And so we tested the idea that this ADAM10 inhibitor might phenocopy the loss of neuroligin-3 in the tumor microenvironment and influence uh, glioma progression in a therapeutic way. And I'm excited to report that, that that's what we found in multiple different models of, uh, of uh, patient-derived uh, glioma xenografts from pediatric glioblastoma to diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma and adult glioblastoma. There's a stagnation and slowing of tumor growth um, when this uh, ADAM10 inhibitor is delivered systemically. And so I'm very excited to report that this is a therapeutic strategy we've just recently brought to clinical trial uh, for children with high-grade gliomas uh, nationally. And so this trial has just opened in the last couple of months, and, and we're hopeful that uh, children will enjoy the same benefit uh, that we're able to, to give to the mice. 
But why is neuroligin-3 such an important mechanism for glioma? You know, what we know so far is that neuronal activity results in uh, the release of, of ADAM10, it's thought to be released in synaptic vesicles, um, and, and that this mediates the cleavage and shedding of the N-terminal ectodomain of neuroligin-3 on the postsynaptic side of synapses, um, both axoglial as well as neuron-to-neuron um, as -neuron synapses. This shed neuroligin-3 then binds to um, a binding partner that we're working hard to identify right now. And after binding, uh, there's a, a very rapid stimulation of multiple oncogenic signaling pathways. There's an early and robust stimulation of focal adhesion kinase pathway um, together with then downstream PI3 kinase mTOR, RAS, and SARC pathways. And so that helps us to understand um, how neuroligin-3 functions as a, as a mitogen and it, perhaps its efficiency in, in promoting glioma growth, but, but it really doesn't explain this unexpected dependency. And so we, we dug deeper and looked at the gene expression changes attributable to neuroligin-3 exposure. And what we found really um, kind of surprisingly was that there were a host of, of synapse-related genes regulated by neuroligin-3 binding. There's a feed-forward effect of neuroligin-3 on its own expression, together with um, uh, upregulation of the, the BDNF receptor TREK-B, but also a number of different glutamate receptor subunits and other synapse-associated structural proteins. When we look um, not at our, our patient-derived cultured and xenografted cells, but instead at primary biopsy samples at the single cell transcriptomic level across the major classes of high-grade glioma, we find that similarly, there is robust expression of synapse-related genes, um, AMPA receptor subunits, the neuroligins, et cetera. And if we look at that single cell transcriptomic data from primary biopsies in a different way, um, we find that each tumor has a subpopulation of cells enriched in synaptic genes. And when we look at the synaptic gene enrichment population, we see that, that this maps very well onto the more OPC-like cells. And so this raises kind of a, a crazy thought that, that like there are axon glial synapses, perhaps there are also axon glioma synapses. When we look by electron microscopy, um, we do see synapse-like structures in the glio in glioma. Uh, and using patient drive xenografts in which we can unambiguously identify the glioma cells um, using um, immunogold labeling of an express protein like GFP, we see these very clear synaptic structures between presynaptic neurons and postsynaptic glioma cells. Looking at those structural synapses a different way and, and asking the idea, asking the question, does neuroligin-3 perhaps contribute to synaptogenesis in this context? We find that uh, glioma cells co-cultured with neurons form far fewer uh, structural synapses when co-cultured with neurons that are neuroligin-3 knockout, suggesting uh, that neuroligin-3 is helping to promote structural synaptogenesis. But are these synapses uh, simply a kind of a shadow of the cell type from which these uh, malignancies come, or are they actually functional? So to, to test this, we collaborated uh, with Rob Malenka's lab, and we xenografted patient-derived glioma cells into a, a, a tractable and, and you know, easy-to-work-with circuit, the hippocampus. And then what Rob's lab did is they performed whole, uh, whole cell patch clamp electrophysiology of the glioma cells. Um, while stimulating the Schaefer collateral afferents into this region. And then after we record from the glioma cells, we can fill them with biocytin dye to confirm that the cell we were recording from was indeed a, a malignant cell. And what we found when we did this was that stimulating the axonal afferents into this region elicits from the glioma cell an excitatory postsynaptic current that depends upon um, neuronal activity. It's blocked by uh, tetrodotoxin. And these currents exhibit multiple characteristics of uh, true synaptic currents. There's really clear paired pulse facilitation. And we can record many EPSCs in the presence of strontium, which encourages um, asymmetrical vesicular release. More specifically, these glioma EPSCs are AMPA receptor dependent, um, blocked by the AMPA receptor blocker MBQX. And we find that the GLUA2 subunit of these synapses is under-edited and, and accordingly um, appears to be calcium permeable, blocked by the calcium permeable amperoceptor antagonist NASPM. In a 
we see these, these excitatory currents, um, synaptic uh, currents in about five to 10% of the glioma cells that we examine. And in a different subset of glioma cells, we instead see um, another electrophysiological response to activity. Instead, we see a, a much longer and larger current. Um, we've found that these prolonged currents scale with field potential, meaning that the more neurons are active, the longer and larger these uh, currents are. And what we've determined these represent are activity dependent potassium evoked currents. Uh, they can be stimulated by potassium in the absence of uh, neuronal activity and um, they're blocked by barium, which, uh, which blocks potassium channels. What we noticed when we uh, performed the biocyte and dye filling in these uh, glioma cells that exhibit the prolonged currents is that not just one glioma cell, but rather a network of glioma cells filled. And this uh, reminded us of a, a really interesting observation from a group in Heidelberg, uh, Frank Winkler's group, that glioma cells can couple to each other uh, through gap junctions. And so we wondered whether this gap junctional coupling was serving to amplify these potassium evoked currents. And we found that indeed using uh, multiple different strategies, here I'm showing you um, uh, data from a, a, a gap junction blocker called meclofenamate, uh, that gap junctional blockade decreases the amplitude of these prolonged currents. Now we can visualize these, um, these currents using genetically encoded calcium indicators. And so if we express GCAMP6S in the human patient derived glioma cells and then xenograph them with two photon microscopy, uh, we can see the evoked um, currents by uh, axonal stimulation. These depend upon neuronal activity, they're blocked by tetrodotoxin. And of course, there's spontaneous activity in, um, in the tumor region. And I think this, this video, this two photon calcium imaging video of glioma shows you very clearly that this cancer is an electrically active tissue. And, and that's not the way that we have been, we have been thinking about it. And it suggests that there may be an important functional significance of these, um, these you know, frequent depolarizing events in the glioma. And that would make some sense because we know during brain development that multiple populations of neural stem and, uh, and other forms of precursor cells are regulated uh, by voltage dependent mechanisms and that membrane depolarization promotes um, proliferation and differentiation of various neural precursor uh, cell populations. And so we tested the idea that the depolarization of the membrane itself was functionally relevant to the glioma cell, again using optogenetics, but this time expressing channel rhodopsin 2 in the glioma cells. We find that in this context, we can um, evoke um, depolarizing currents using blue light. And if we xenograph these cells into the brain, we can then optogenetically depolarize the tumor. And what we find when we do that is that indeed membrane depolarization alone promotes the proliferation of these malignant cells. Conversely, if we block glutamatergic neurotransmission by expressing a dominant negative version of the GLUA2 subunit or pharmacologically blocking AMPA receptors, we find that there's a, a stark decrease in glioma growth and progression. And so what's emerging is this understanding that malignant glioma is integrating into neural circuits. It's doing this both through um, AMPA receptor dependent um, synapses, as well as electrically through um, activity dependent potassium evoked currents that are amplified through a gap junctionally coupled glioma network. And I think that the, the mechanistic parallels evident in, in normal and malignant neuron glial interactions really underscores the extent to which this disease hijacks mechanisms of normal development and plasticity and demands that we approach these cancers from a neuroscience perspective. Uh, there are many people to thank, um, our, our critically important uh, collaborators, funding sources, um, my, my lab, um, who I'm, I'm deeply grateful to, and of course, the patients and families whose donation of tumor tissue enables all of the work that we do. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michelle. I'll give you a virtual clap <laughs> because you can't see the audience in this format. <laughs> Um, that was marvelous. It's just really great to see the, the transition from the basic science to the clinical and back. And I'll just remind everybody there's a link um, to put in your questions on Slido. And we, we already have a few. Um, the first one is actually from very early in the talk, 
asking about what the what you foresee as the translational pathway to develop therapies. And you immediately went thereafter to talk about the atom time inhibitor. But I, I think that's really a really important question with this type of work. So maybe you could spend, uh, tell us a little bit about how you foresee going from these trials that you're initiating now, if they're successful, what's the path after yeah, that? Absolutely. I mean, I think one thing to remember is that, you know, these cancers are, um, they are seemingly intractable. This is, this is the hardest nut to crack. You know, we have tried so many different things as a field over the last, you know, many decades to treat high grade gliomas and, and really, um, this is a very difficult tumor that's almost certainly going to require multimodal therapy. And so I think that in addition to targeting the cell intrinsic vulnerabilities of these cancer cells, which is, is kind of how we've traditionally approached cancer, we need to, in addition, target these, yeah, you know, really important microenvironmental mechanisms that, that are driving and enabling tumor growth, as well as, you know, as a third kind of prong of therapy, you know, leveraging the power of the immune system to try to, to um, you know, fight these tumors in a different and additional way. And so I, you know, I don't think there's going to be any one standalone therapy, but I do think that the integration of this kind of cancer into brain circuits and, and the growth signals and probably survival signals that are derived <clears throat> Are something that we have to target if we want to eradicate this tumor. And so, you know, I think ADAM10 inhibition to target neuroligin 3 is one mechanism. I think we're going to have to do many things. And so, you know, one effort of my lab in recent years has been to, um, you know, to try to to screen different potential important neurophysiological targets. And so we're kind of in the midst of this, this screening, trying to understand if we can leverage existing medicines that we use and in epilepsy and cardiology, you know, all of the, the medicines we've developed to target electrically, um, you know, responsive and active cells and, and to see which are important in, in glioma pathophysiology. What are the relevant ion channels? What are the relevant, um, you know, voltage dependent mechanisms of growth? Are there additional kinds of synapses um, and, and other neurotransmitter, you know, classes that we need to be thinking about? And so we're very early, I think, in our understanding and ability to therapeutically target this interaction. But now that we know it's there, you you know, I think we have our work cut out for us and, and there may hopefully be the opportunity to leverage existing brain penetrant drugs that we've you know developed for other purposes um, to help help improve the outcomes for glioma. Yeah great thanks so much. Um, so the next question is actually something I was wondering about also. Um, somebody asked to what extent do mRNAs encoding voltage gated sodium and potassium channels differ between glia normal glia and glioma glia. And, you know, I guess I'd like to broaden that a little bit is, it, are there abnormalities in the synapses, do you think, that could be targeted for additional therapy? Yeah, this is a this is a really important question because ideally we would target the neuron glioma interactions without disrupting normal neuron glial interactions or other important neurophysiological interactions. And, and that's really the challenge because the tumor is taking advantage of normal brain physiology. And so those are exactly the kinds of questions we're currently asking. You know, the, the malignant glioma cells um, molecularly resemble normal OPCs greatly but we don't yet know what the biochemistry of the synapse is at the, at the neuron um, glioma synapse. You know, we're, we're working to understand what proteins are present, how they're trafficked, if there's plasticity, what's different. You know, and one, one difference that we are aware of from our early work um, is that there are these calcium permeable AMPA receptors that are less present or less prominent in mature neurons, um, but actually are present in normal OPCs. Those are also calcium permeable AMPA receptors. Oh. And so, you know, there, there are lots of similarities. We're trying to understand the differences and trying to understand, um, you know, how we can uh, gain some purchase in in, you know, disrupting neuron, the malignant interaction while maintaining uh, the healthy interaction. Yeah, I mean, to me, it just seems like a fabulous um, sort of handle to, to turn in order to develop a new type of therapy, like you say, in combination with other therapies. So yeah. very exciting. Thank you. Um, next question is whether any of the candidates you talked about could be used as biomarkers for early detection of gluten. Mm, this is a really interesting question. Um, and it actually brings up the whole, you know, the broader idea of early detection in these diffusely infiltrative integrative um, malignancies. You know, they, these come to attention after they have really um, 
typically in, infiltrated and integrated into a fairly wide geographic swath of brain. And I think that's actually one of the early clues that, um, that those interactions were important because the, these tumors don't destroy brain primarily, they integrate and preserve, um, you know, function, which is, is, has always been fascinating to me. Um, and, and so how early could we find them? And, and, you know, if we found them early, how, what difference will that make in our ability to, to fight them? You know, unlike, um, some cancers, you know, like breast cancer um, or lung cancer, where you know early detection really impacts outcome, that has not yet been the case for glioma. In part because we don't have effective therapies, you know, and, and hopefully that will change. <laughs> early detection will be more relevant and more salient. Um, but but the, it's a really interesting question. You know, could we could we um, could we detect changes in CSF or in blood? Um, you know, of, of some of these markers to, to help us in a non-invasive way or a less invasive way, um, you know, find people at risk. Um, and and it's, a, it's a good question. I don't have an answer. Uh, there is a whole field of people working on what, you know, so-called liquid biopsies for glioma, trying to find cell-free DNA in blood and CSF um, so that you can kind of screen for some of these more common malignancies. And so I think that's um, a different kind of biomarker um, you know, uh, yeah, maybe reading, uh, go to the realm dark. that is promising in another way. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Um, next question. Um, somebody, this one is anonymous. The activity dependent molecular and cellular glial effects are really interesting. Might these phenomena play a role in the connectopathies, perhaps even neurodevelopmental conditions like autism? Very interesting question. Um, and, and my answer is yes, maybe. I think that's a really interesting hypothesis. It's, you know, how do, um, how does aberrant circuit dynamics contribute to, you know, a range of diseases? And, and sort of the flip side of that is how do altered patterns of activity, perhaps, how does, how do these adaptive or activity dependent changes become maladaptive when there's abnormal patterns of activity. And I think Juliet Knoll's work, um, you know, together in, in my lab and John Huguenard's lab showing that, um, you know, aberrantly increased activity dependent myelination, you know, contributes to promoting um, epilepsy is, is a concept of maladaptive myelination that could be applied across a range of neuropsychiatric diseases. And I think we're really just at the very beginning of understanding how these, you know, activity dependent changes could contribute to pathophysiology when they're dysregulated. Yeah, I, and I guess sort of a cool, actually when the question said connectopathies, I was thinking about seizure susceptibility and people who have glioblastoma and gliomas are very susceptible to getting seizures around them. Do you think that's associated with, so you're talking about the glioma being an infiltrative process and pre preserving the circuit, but there are circuit disruptions. So do you think that's like a normal response of the neurons to abnormal glia, or do you think it's something that the yeah. glioma cells are actually doing to the neurons? Yeah. So actually, there's a there's a lot of evidence that the glia, just as neur, so just as neurons promote uh, glioma growth, there's a lot of evidence that the glioma cells very very robustly and powerfully um, influence neuronal function and and actually probably circuit remodeling. And so Harold Sontheimer and Ben Deneen have shown beautifully that in adult glioblastoma, um, the glioma cells promote hyperexcitability through non-synaptic secretion of glutamate, through secretion of synaptogenic factors, um, as well as through, um, in adult glioblastoma, sort of specific um, <clears throat> toxicity to inhibitory interneurons. And so the seizures, um, you know, then, then the hyperexcitability, which can manifest as clinically evident seizures, then kind of drives the cycle of neuron glioma, glioma neuron interactions. It's, it's really quite insidious. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, yeah, seizures are um, certainly a consequence of glioma. They may in fact also contribute to glioma progression um, and, and, you know, un, uh, kind of yeah. undoing, disintegrating this, um, this yeah. sort of vicious cycle is going to be important. Has anybody ever looked at that, whether there's more glioma growth in people? with more excitability um, so on like EEG or frequency of seizures or yeah yeah it's it's um 
it's a really interesting question. It's a hard one to, you know, there, there are, there are genetic um, predisposition syndromes that are also associated with syndrome with, with seizures in which people, um, you know, have a higher incidence, particularly of low grade gliomas, you know, like uh, tuberous sclerosis, you know, I think what comes first, the chicken or the egg um, isn't clear yet. And, and certainly there are people who are more susceptible to glioma and some of those genetic risk factors may be very neurobiologically, um, you know, uh, founded. I think there's a lot of, of really interesting population science um, work to come out soon that that might indicate that you know people who have perhaps differentially um, you know I'm, I'm, I'm just speculating and hypothesizing now but you know differentially upregulated mechanisms of plasticity that might encourage and enable glioma growth um, those people may be more susceptible when they have an oncogenic mutation in in the wrong cell at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. And then um, I just have one last question. We have a few more minutes. So um, maybe you could talk a little bit about normal glia and their response to activity. So if I remember correctly, you've shown that OPCs, oligodendrocyte precursor cells, do divide when there's stimulation of neurons and then they come and further myelinate neurons. Mm -hmm. But they don't, they don't create a tumor when they do that. Right. So even though there's more activity, they don't right. they don't do that. So um, clearly, there's something else. They have mechanisms to prevent from continuing to divide. And how much is known about that in OPCs? And do you think OPCs are actually the cell that starts the glioblastoma? Yeah, yeah. So so we do think, and we have quite a bit of evidence that OPCs are actually the cell of origin for many forms of high grade glioma, including uh, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, which is the tumor. Um, you know, that accounts, it's the, the leading cause of uh, brain tumor related death in children. Um, and, and, you know, that tumor initiates only when there is a specific mutation. In that case, it's a mutation in a histone gene, other, you know, clearly positive or at least required, you know, uh, oncogenic mutations are present in, in different molecularly distinct classes of glioma. But the presence of an oncogenic mutation may not be enough to initiate the tumor. You may also need these important microenvironmental interactions. And we have some evidence for that. I didn't have time to talk about it today, but, you know, testing the idea that neuronal activity is a key, um, is key in tumor initiation. Um, uh, my lab collaborated with David Gutman's lab at WashU using um, a, a sort of genetically accurate model of neurofibromatosis one um, syndrome associated gliomas in which uh, in this particular mouse model, almost 100% of the mice develop optic pathway gliomas because of a specific NF1 mutation uh, in a precursor cell. And um, if we modulate optic pathway activity, um, either optogenetic or by placing mice in the dark for a, during a sort of a period um, before the tumor initiates, the tumors never form. And so we, you know, have really clear evidence that at least in that context of optic pathway gliomas, you know, caused by the NF1 mm -hmm. mutation, that a required component of that is adequate um, above threshold uh, neuronal activity. And, and that mechanism seems also to be uh, interestingly neurally and three dependent um, in this low-grade glioma model. So I'm sorry, it's a whole other talk that I didn't have time to, <laughs> to give, but I do think that, um, you know, these, that there is the susceptibility of the oncogenic mutation in the precursor cell of origin, but then other well, things have to, um, have to line up for it to happen. Yeah, and it's almost like in that case, there's a critical period where it needs to happen. Seems. In that ge particular genetic syndrome, that's clear. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because pediatric gliomas, both low grade and high grade, do follow these spatiotemporal patterns, sort of indicating that there are susceptible cells in susceptible states at susceptible times of development. And so understanding yeah. all of that is, is really, I think, required to fully understanding the malignancies. Yeah. And perhaps it will be a key to understanding other malign malignancies as well. But um, very exciting work. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. Thanks. I really enjoyed hearing about it. And I know there's lots more you didn't talk about. So maybe we'll have you back in a few days. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me today. And, and thanks everybody for putting in your questions. You can continue to do that throughout the meeting for each talk, put in your questions for the speakers. And um, right now I'm just going to introduce uh, Brian Wandel, who's going to then introduce our next speaker. So thanks again, Michelle.